Well, I took care of this patient when uh, she was 86 years old. Uh, that was five years ago. And at that time, she was uh, 220 pounds, uh, five foot one. Uh, she had congestive heart failure. She was already uh, wheelchair bound for two years. And um, so I got to see her. And uh, six months later, she started walking with assistance. And uh, about uh, a year later, she got herself a boyfriend who was uh, 10 years her junior. So this patient is a certified cougar. <laughs> um, here she is uh, after, uh, after five years. Uh, she is uh, now 140 pounds. She now uh, walks uh, with, a, with a cane in her gardens every morning. And uh, she puts on her own makeup um, whenever her boyfriend comes to visit. And uh, I cannot disclose her name, um, her real name, but for our purposes here, I call her mom. <laughs> and I inherited all of my mitochondria from her. So, um, I've been coming here for the past uh, seven years, in fact, and uh, 30 days every quarter. And it always happens that I spend my birthday here, like today. And uh, I confess that age brings happiness. Uh, every time that I'm here, I am energized and uh, I feel happier being here. And it's not only because of what they say that age brings emotional stability, but rather, it's because age has brought me friends like you. And I thank you all for being here. For the support and the willingness and openness of mind to listen to what I have to say. So, really, the title is not that boring title that you got in your uh, invitation, but it's how to keep your mitochondria healthy and age happy. That's me in 1983, a third year medical school. And that's me um, uh, last July at Prince Edward Island in the Canadian Maritimes. So this is a lecture on continuing basic medical education. It's not continuing medical education, it's more clinical oriented. And what I want to do is just, I just want you to sit back and relax as we try to update um, the information that we got from medical school. There have been fundamental shifts in perspective in uh, perspectives in medicine. It's like these images here where you could actually see this woman as a beautiful woman that's forehead to chin looking backwards. Or you could see this as an old hag where the chin becomes a nose and the shoulder becomes the lips. Or you could see this as this woman who's actually back uh, towards you wearing a fur coat facing a river. Or you could actually see um, the face that's actually framed by the trees. So what are the major shifts in perspective that we ought to be thinking about? I've presented this in separate lectures in the past. Uh, the first is the interpretation of the central dogma of biology has changed. We know that DNA trans, uh, transcribes to RNA, translates to protein, but it's a pure synthesis point of view. It's a protein synthesis point of view. So now it's about the flow of information. DNA information gives rise to RNA information, gives rise to protein information. And uh, uh, the significant thing that happened here is that we now know that RNA information gives rise back to DNA information. What's the clinical significance of this? It was in HIV AIDS. Uh, HIV reverse transit phase was uh, discovered in 1970. Uh, we, uh, the Nobel Awards were given for it in 1975. I took biochemistry in 1980 and knew nothing about reverse transcriptase until I did my first CT scan of my first AIDS patient in this country in 1986. And inhibition of reverse transcriptase is still the major mechanism by which uh, we deal with HIV AIDS today. And I've been informed that pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP using Truvada uh, it's not available in this country, but those drugs, those are two drugs, and they're still based on inhibiting reverse transcriptase. That is the significance of reversing uh, or shifting the paradigm from protein synthesis to uh, flow of information. Now, the second um, shift in perspective that we, sh we uh, are encountering is that 
gut microbiota is now considered a postnatal organ. It's an organ that grows from birth and all the way to the first year of life. At the first year of life, it has a stable adult-like signature and it's unique as your fingerprint. You can view it like this. From birth to 12 months, there is decreasing inter individual variability and increasing bacterial diversity. Now, uh, can we measure this? Sure. Uh, for example, can we measure what your organisms are producing? For example, uh, if you're producing arabinose, uh, a lot of arabinose, you know that you have a, a, a yeast infestation, probably candida. And take a look at this, we can also measure the HPPA, which is produced by Clostridia species, known to uh, colonize a lot of autistic children. And um, this is so that you, when your patients ask you, you know, have you heard of poop transplant? Yes, they already do uh, fecal uh, microbiota transplantation, and this is used for treating uh, children with uh, C. Uh, Clostridia uh, infection, which uh, can cause debilitating diarrhea, and they have 90% success at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, you will see, be seeing more journals like this. Right now, it's just for Clostridia difficile, but you will see this now being used for multiple sclerosis and for neuropsychiatric diseases because um, your gut bacteria do affect your brain and behavior, and there are studies now on, uh, ongoing for schizophrenia and for bipolar disorders. Now, the third shift in perspective is that vitamin B is activated not only by the kidneys for calcium regulation, but is activated and used by virtually all cells of the body to control about 2,000 genes. Now, this is what we learn in medical school. Vitamin D is hydroxylated in the liver, and then it's uh, activated in the kidneys and it's used for calcium metabolism. That's only 15% of the pathway, as we discovered. All cells in the body can virtually activate vitamin D. And um, related to our discussion tonight, remember that vitamin D is activated and deactivated at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So what's the significance of this? If you are treating uh, patients with cancers like breast cancer, thyroid cancer, colon cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or treating diabetes, uh, fractures, multiple sclerosis, heart attacks, kidney cancer, and endometrial cancer, why not optimize the levels of vitamin D in your patients. Uh, can we measure this? Sure. It's like a pregnancy test now. All you need is a drop of blood. And this is a cassette, two lines, and you're deficient. And the cutoff is 32 nanograms per ml. You have the result in 10 minutes. Now, uh, you might remember uh, that uh, this was the way they presented the human cell before. There was a nucleus with a DNA inside, and there is mitochondria as a cell membrane. Well, that was your time. Your high school kids are probably learning about it this way. Here are the usual suspects. Um, uh, there's the nucleus and uh, various organelles, and our query tonight is the mitochondria. Now, the next shift in perspective, which is our subject tonight, is that each human cell is two microorganisms. Now, that, how did this come about? Some uh, two to three billion years ago, um, an alpha protein bacterium that, that, that did only aerobic respiration or producing energy with oxygen went into a symbiotic relationship with a methanogen which could produce energy only without oxygen. And the symbiosis actually happened because of the rising oxygen levels and at that time it was fluctuating for it was, it was beneficial for an organism to actually have both uh, modes of uh, production of energy. Um, that is a sanitized version, you know, that's politically correct. Uh, in 2011, there came out a study that showed that the original mitochondria actually had a kleptogene, the purpose of which was to steal the energy being produced by the anaerobic bacteria. Uh, but the rising oxygen levels took out uh, the organisms that had that kind of gene in favor of the symbiosis that we have now. Now, this is how the evolutionary tree looks like. You could see the mitochondria actually uh, uh, preceding the growth of large organisms like animal, fungi, and plants. And that means that really we needed energy in order to grow. Bacteria and archaea, as you know, remain as one cell organisms. If uh, we, uh, our human cells, are considered as two organisms, plants have three organisms. Because after acquiring the mitochondria, they acquire the, uh, the blue-green algae, the uh, cyanobacteria, and then they became the, the chloroplast of plants. 
All right? So here's how the symbiosis looks like. You have the nucleocytosol on one side doing uh, anaerobic respiration, and then the mitochondria on the other side uh, doing uh, aerobic respiration. Uh, and um, so this is the way I would like to stylize the two organisms. You have X for the chromosome, uh, standing for the chromosome, you know, producing anaerobic energy production or glycolysis, and then zero for the uh, circular uh, mitochondrial DNA, producing energy production via the tricarboxylic acid cycle and the electron transport chain. Now, fatty acids is there because, as I was telling people a few moments ago, uh, mitochondria are the only organelles in your body that can actually burn out your fatty acids into energy. There's nothing else. Now, they, these two communicate, and the end product of uh, aerobic glycolysis is, of course, pyruvate, and then there's, uh, under certain, certain conditions, uh, lactate and alanine. But you're saying, Dr. Ted, I really don't need to know pyruvate, lactate, and alanine. But you do. The reason is that there's already a pyruvate uh, supplement and there are also beta alanine supplements. And the neurologists here, I think, uh, have put in their two cents on whether or not uh, lactate is the preferred fuel of human brain metabolism in vivo. That's a big controversy. But in 2008, it's already been proven that lactate is the preferred energy of the brain in aerobic exercise. So when runners here say, I'm going to go out and think and clear my head, you're actually pr producing lactate in your muscles. It goes to your brain, and you're able to think more properly because you're providing the right fuel for it. But um, really, my interest in um, in uh, uh, anaerobic uh, respiration um, has something to do with Ben's interest in wine. As we all know, that uh, a byproduct of uh, aer um, anaerobic respiration is that which is placed in uh, the finest libations in the world, ethanol. Um, remember this naughty little and mnemonic that we used to have in medical school. If you remember what it stands for, recited me, there's a citrate, isocitrate, ketoglutarate, succinyl coenzyme A succinate, fumarate, malate, and oxaloacetate. Well, you say you don't really need to know that, right? I think you do. You see, um, as I said earlier, there's already a pyruvate supplement, right? The coenzyme A of acetyl coenzyme A and succinyl coenzyme A actually come from pantothenic acid or vitamin B5. If you recall the shampoo, um, Pantene, that's actually pantothenic acid and it is actually formulated by a Filipino. There's a citrate uh, supplement. There's also an alpha ketoglutarate supplement. There's a succinic acid supplement. There's a fumaric acid supplement, there's a malic acid supplement, and there's an oxaloacetate supplement. So your patient comes to you and says, Doctor, am I, I am on oxaloacetate supplement. Is it any good? At least you know where it is in the Krebs cycle. All right. So can we measure this metabolites of the anaerobic and anaerobic organism within us? Yes, absolutely. For X, for the, for the anaerobic uh, organism, here you can see lactic acid and pyruvic acid. And for energy metabolism, of course, these are the metabolites of the Krebs cycle. Did we forget anything? Yes, we did. We forgot about the ketone body, beta hydroxybutyrate. And there is already a supplement for that too. It's used by athletes on the ketogenic diet and by cancer patients on the ketogenic diet. Now, this is... Um, uh, the general pathway, the nucleocytosol uh, organism uses glycolysis and of course the mitochondrion generates energy using the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. But that is not the main point of this slide. The point of this is that from pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A you need thiamine pyrophosphate or vitamin B1. Now flavin adenine dinucleotide sounds like riboflavin which is vitamin B2. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is nicotinamide or vitamin B3. And as I said, uh, the coenzyme A of acetyl coenzyme A is vitamin B5. And if you take a look at the major pathways uh, that convert uh, macronutrients into energy, they all need the B vitamins, the entire spectrum of them. You could give them as B100 or singly depending upon the measured levels. And can you measure them? Oh, absolutely. 
you can measure the levels of B5 vitamins nowadays. Now, looking at the, um, there are educators here, and looking at the model now of two organisms, we see that when we went to medical school, we only learned half of the uh, foundation par foundational paradigm of Western medical science. Um, we learned about the anatomical perspective of biology and medicine. We learned about the Darwinian paradigm of evolution, anatomical paradigm of disease, like tissue-specific symptoms are the result of tissue-specific effects, and that's why we have all the different organ-based specialties. And we learned about the Mendelian paradigm of inheritance. And we, when we couldn't explain it, it's why a reason why I really hate genetics, is that when we couldn't explain it, we said, well, let's do to the environment. Well, that era is gone now. We now have the uh, mitochondrial view or the bioenergetic perspective, which we should be adding into our foundational paradigm of Western biomedical science. The bioenergetic paradigm of evolution has always bothered me because when I was working on consciousness 20, some 20 plus years ago, I have always wondered why we do not follow the second law of thermodynamics, that we are, uh, we are headed for entropic doom. I mean, we should be decaying, right? But we actually take in energy and we continually build complexity. And the mitochondrial organism within us actually explains that. And then we have the bio, we can now include the bioenergetic paradigm of disease. Uh, systemic energy deficiency can result in tissue specific symptoms. And now we actually are exposed to non Mendelian uh, forms of inheritance, which is actually a lot more fun because you're simply counting the number of mutant bacteria. Um, so the corollary to having the human cell, viewing the human cell as two organisms, is that mito mitochondrial bioenergetics provides a unifying pathophysiological and genetic mechanism for neuropsychiatric diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, metabolic diseases such as diabetes and obesity, and autoimmune diseases, aging and cancer. Now, this model is not mine, and um, I know this slide is very busy, but just follow me. The nuclear DNA variations, mitochondrial DNA variations, and environmental factors all contribute to uh, oxidative phosphorylation and can induce mitochondrial damage, which produces uh, progressive bioenergetic decline, producing degenerative diseases, aging, metabolic disease, cancer, and immunologic disease. Now, this model is of mine. It's by Dr. Douglas Wallace. He's been doing this for 31 years. And this paper is actually included in your handout tonight for you to actually read in detail. Now, what is a confession without the high priests? Um, this is uh, Dr. Douglas Wallace. He was the one who identified chloramphenicol resistance as being due to mitochondrial DNA resistance. Um, he um, described MRF, or myoclonic epilepsy with ragged, ragged red fibers. He uh, and his group identified that human mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from the mother. That's why I started this um, uh, lecture with my mom. And he reconstructed the origin of the ancient migration patterns of women, for which is known for. But what's more interesting is that he's won the Pasana Award, which is like predictor for the Oscars. He's going to win the Nobel pretty soon. Uh, but he's already won the Gruber Prize in Genetics, which is the equivalent of the Nobel in Genetics. Um, and when he was applying for his position at CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, there's a famous article that said it's like Einstein, you know, knocking to work on your um, physics laboratory. So the videos here are taken from two of his lectures, one last year on April 2 uh, at NIH, and the other at the Luminaries of Medicine lecture is 2015 at the USC School of Greenville, of Medicine in Greenville. But the real, real reason why I love this guy is that he could write an article with this title, get it accepted at a peer-reviewed journal because of his gravitas. And uh, what are the problems that we are concerned about? Well, of course, there are all the neuropsychiatric diseases. Being in pediatrics, and I went to CHOP for a specific reason, to look at pediatric diseases, but one of the most obvious is autism, which is now uh, assumed to be one in 88 boys being affected. Or Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's, or migraine, or depression, or schizophrenia, or obsessive compulsive disorders. Or in the heart and muscle, cardiomyopathy, cardiovascular disease, myalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, or the visceral diseases, renal, hepatic, 
and gastrointestinal diseases, or metabolic diseases, type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, inflammatory diseases, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, cancer, and aging. All of these are, in fact, the major concerns we have, and yet they are the ones that we seem to be least able to address. The next uh, guy I'm introducing is known in blogs as the man who shrinks brain tumors. He's uh, Dr. Thomas Tafey. He published a book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, Under Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer. And he has information showing that cancer can be best defined as a mitochondrial metabolic disease rather than as a genetic disease. And he's involved in the development of new non-toxic cancer therapies, including the ketogenic diet. Uh, the video here is taken from his 20 February 2015 lecture, Cancer and Metabolic Disease with Metabolic Solutions. So the provocative question is, cancer a nuclear genetic disease or a metabolic, mitochondrial metabolic? It's very important because the answer to this question will change the way we uh, uh, study the disease and the way we uh, try to manage uh, the disease. So uh, what in, in today, uh, the academic and pharmaceutical industries view cancer as a genetic disease. And this is what we call the dogma. This is a belief, uh, an unshakable belief is a dogma. And uh, this paper, Hallmarks of Cancer, the Next Generation by uh, uh, Hanahan and Weinberg, is one of the most highly cited from their previous and their current papers. This is cited many, many times because this sets out the dogma as cancer is a genetic disease. And when I say it's a dogma, it, 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 because I teach biology at Boston College, and all the books on biochemistry, cell biology, biology, they talk about cancer as a genetic disease involved with uh, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and this kind of stuff. It's in all the textbooks. Our young people are indoctrinated into thinking and studying cancer as a genetic disease. It's the fundamental basis for the pharmaceutical and academic industries and their grants and their approaches and things like this. Is that, is that right, though? Is that right, though? So, no two ways about it, you guys need to plow through some basics and consequences. Uh, so quick basics, mitochondria have their own DNA called mitochondrial DNA or empty DNA. They are circular, they are naked. Each mitochondria contains about 1 to 15 copies of mitochondrial DNA, an average of 5. They mutate very rapidly, they are mutating inside us right now. Each human cell contains an average of about 500 mitochondria, but the number depends on the energy needs of the type of tissue. I was surprised that someone said, I thought each cell only had one mitochondria. But uh, the liver cells, for example, can have up to one, one to 2,000 mitochondria per hepatic cell. All mitochondria are, mit are maternally derived. Mitochondria can commit suicide inside the cell in a process called mitophagy. And mitochondria can also signal the entire cell to commit suicide uh, a process called apoptosis. There are approximately 100 quadrillion mitochondria in the human body versus the gut, which is 100 trillion. And the total number of cells in the human body is about 37 billion. We are outnumbered. And I, I'm not making these numbers up. There are really papers that actually show the estimated number of cells in the human body. Now, this is a mitochondrion, as you might remember. This, it has a, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, discuss the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and the intermembrane space that uh, they enclose. And then, of course, the matrix inside. Then there's a circular DNA molecule right there. There's ATP synthase, uh, which uh, uh, is a nanomachine that looks like this. It turns around like a gear. Um, and then there's the electron transport chain. Um, I know you guys have forgotten about the electron transport chain, so let's make it a fun review. Here's the mitochondrial electron transport chain, not too fun, is it? Uh, there are only five complexes, one to five, and let's make it fun. NADH actually donates electrons to the complex one, and uh, uh, succinate donates electrons to complex two, and um, the electrons are shuttled by coenzyme Q to complex three, and from uh, complex 3, uh, cytochrome C actually brings the electrons to uh, complex 4, where oxygen is the final uh, electron donor to produce water, and the proton gradient that's generated is actually used to produce ATP. I'm not making up the supplements, they're all available. Now, for those of you who give statins, you should know by now that um, 
you inhibit the biosynthesis of coenzyme Q. Um, and therefore, one of the first things that your patients experience after statin treatment, um, and in fact, some almost immediately, is generalized weakness. Now, this is the video that took the mitochondrial world by the storm. It's very highly viewed. I presented it last time. And let's take a look at the mitochondria inside the cell. Well, here it is. It does look like a bacterium. It pulls itself along the microtubules of the cell. And here's the close-up of the membrane. There's a between, we're between the inner and outer membrane and the intermembrane space. That's active transport. There's a shadow of the mitochondrial DNA in the back. And those are the farms of your ATP synthase that produce ATP. This is the bilipid layer. And you can see there's ATP synthase actually turning around. They're really very neat nanomachines. And there's an anti-porter, one in, one out. And these are swimming inside our bodies right now, and yes, they do form clusters like this inside a cell. I see a lot of you doing this. Well, they are there. So in 2005, uh, Nick Ling um, wrote this book. I wish I wrote it. It was called Power, Sex, and Suicide. And if not for the subtitle of Mitochondria and the Meaning of Life, I was actually thinking of something more salacious. So let's uh, take a look at uh, uh, power because uh, mitochondria produce ATP, sex because it's inherited from the mother, and suicide because they induce apoptosis. Let's take a look at sex and suicide first because they're more violent. Um, so these are the mitochondria behaving as bacteria and uh, will take fission, fusion, movement, and mitophagy. And this is called mitochondrial biodynamics. Now, if you take a look at this video, the red ones are those with wild type or normal DNA. The green are those with mutant DNA. You could see that they actually uh, undergo fusion. They create the yellow uh, mitochondria and they undergo fission. So, and that's called a um, kiss and run phenomenon. The, the mitochondrial bacteria always just run into each other, they fuse, they exchange DNA, and then they part ways over again. This is the mitochondrial network around the nucleus, there's a central nucleus in there, and um, you could see the mixing of the mitochondria. They really move like this inside us. Now, uh, let's take a look at fission itself. Mitochondria do not do uh, mitosis. They divide like regular bacteria, so you have mitochondrial reduction, right? So what does it mean? It means that the DNA of the mitochondria are actually distributed stochastically or at random. So you can have mutant DNA on one side and uh, normal DNA on the other side. Or um, common question is, can you produce mitochondria without any DNA? Yes, you actually can. And these are rapidly garbage collected by the body. Now, this is the case with uh, Females, in utero they have about uh, six to seven million germ cells, and um, at birth they have about one million. And during the creation of these germ cells, the mitochondria will distribute themselves randomly. So you could have a, 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 an egg that has about 80% mitochondria, uh, that are mutant, uh, eggs that have 50% mutant mitochondria, and eggs that have 20% mutant mitochondria. All of us have some mutation of some sort. Now, this is the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA. As you can see, uh, there's the egg with its mitochondria. The sperm has about 50 to 100 mitochondria in order to be able to swim and fertilize the egg. Once it enters the egg, uh, it actually gets chewed out and thrown out, and because only the DNA is interesting to the mother. 
So I confess that men here who have been thrown out by women should not feel bad because this has been happening for about 150,000 years. Um, so the problem that becomes, is this a threshold problem uh, when you produce disease where if you have about 70% threshold, you manifest disease? Or is this more of an analog problem where if you have 80% mutant, you have a child with severe disease, a 50% mutant, you have a child with mild disease, or 20% mutant and you have a child with no disease? Turns out, uh, we're more analog than that. If you could see, there's a DNA mutation here, and with the same mutation, 10 to 30 percent of mitochondria are mutated, you produce autism and type 1 and type 2 diabetes. 70 percent mutation, you have uh, myopathy, cardiomyopathy and MILAS, and uh, at 100 percent, you have perinatal lethality. So what's the clinical significance of this? Uh, there are people here who do in vitro fertilization, and the uh, significance is the three-person IVF. If you have a mother with uh, a lot of mutant mitochondria, then you just get the maternal nuclear genome from her, uh, get the father's sperm, and then get the uh, healthy donor for the mitochondria, and you put them together, and you have a free person in vitro fertilization. Now, fusion. Now, just bear with me here, because there are two um, membranes that have to fuse. So the outer membrane, of course, has to fuse and so does the inner membrane that has to fuse. The inner membrane uses a protein called OPA1 for fusion. And OPA1, the clue is in the name. OPA1 stands for Optic Atrophy 1. So if you are accumulating mutations in Optic Atrophy 1, you get your, your failure of fusion of the inner mitochondrial membrane, you will get Optic Atrophy. This is a sample of the fusion uh, of mitochondria surrounding a nucleus. The central dark area is uh, the nucleus. And you can see that they form healthy mitochondrial networks uh, around in order to power the cell. Now, let's take movement. Movement is actually very interesting. Uh, uh, there are nanomachines that pull the mitochondria towards the nucleus or pull it away from the nucleus. And they are anchored by the mirror protein. And this is very, very important, especially for neurons with very, very long axons and dendrites. And as you can see here in the letter D, uh, the mitochondria can be pulled uh, away from, from the nucleus, towards the axon or towards the, the nucleus, and it could stay in place. And this one is simply to illustrate that you need power for your synapses and for your dendrites, and your mitochondria needs to pull, need, uh, need to get pulled in there as well. And mitophagy is actually um, uh, the form of mitochondrial suicide. Usually when mitochondria divide, uh, those that have uh, very little ener energy production are actually shoved off to one side. And what it does uh, is that the damaged mitochondria douses itself with pink one, kind of dousing yourself with gasoline. It recruits a protein called parkin, and uh, parkin now causes the formation of isolation membrane around their mitochondria. Again, the clue is in the name. Parkin is a protein. If it is mutated, then um, you will get Parkinson's disease. The pathway is actually a little bit uh, uh, more than that. You have a damaged mitochondria surrounding itself with a pink one protein, and then it recruits Parkin. And then ubiquitin, which is a targeting uh, protein, uh, uh, marks it up and then isolation membrane forms, and then that, when, when it's already a globule, it's called an autophagosome, right? And then it's presented to the lysosome for um, recycling. Now, we discussed about mitophagy of damaged mitochondria in terms of the pink parking uh, mechanism. Um, remember that your red blood cells used to have mitochondria, and you lost them, and that goes by a different form of mitophagy using an X1 protein. And the significance of this, I will tell you in the next slide. And of course, this is the same mechanism where how females throw out the male mitochondria from the fertilized egg. Now, you should remember that the mitochondria actually is where heme synthesis begins and ends. And in order to accommodate the hemoglobin, it actually uh, undergoes mitophagy and you have hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. 
Okay, putting it all together, fusion fission uh, movement and mitophagy, it's uh, very evident in mitochondrial degenerative diseases. This is the wild type, of course, you have a normal distribution of your mitochondria. No fusion, you have very, very small mitochondria that cannot power the central portion of your cell. No fission, meaning um, you have very, very long mitochondria that cannot travel uh, to the synapses. And you have uh, no motility, therefore uh, you cannot power up your synapses as well. And no mitophagy, and you have no garbage collection. So what does it mean for the neuron? So it means that we could use uh, mitochondrial biodynamics now to explain Alzheimer's disease, dominant at at optic atrophy, as I mentioned, OPA1, Parkinson's disease, uh, cerebellar degeneration, Huntington's disease, uh, sharp way to type 2A. Now, somatic deletion mutations affecting mitochondria accumulate throughout life, but may accrue at different rates in different tissues. In the brain, for example, the highest deletion levels are found in the basal ganglion, followed by the cortex and the cerebellum. Neurologists are very aware, uh, well aware of this. First, the basal ganglia are affected, and then your memory loss happens, and then you, are, uh, you become unstable in your gait. So let's take a look at the five features of mitochondrial metabolism central to the pathophysiology of age-related diseases, cancer, and aging. These are energy production, uh, reactive oxygen species formation, redox balance, calcium metabolism, uh, calcium balance rather, and apoptosis. So this is a mitochondrial biochemistry lesson from hell. I've never had a medical student that liked it, but in fact, uh, I love it, and therefore you'll be tortured. All right, this is a mitochondrion, and I would like to touch on five areas. One is the electron transport chain. The second is the production of the superoxide radical. The third is the redox balance, uh, provided mostly by your thiols, especially with the thiol, and then your uh, calcium balance, and then, of course, uh, apoptosis. We now know that it's cytochrome C from the um, electron transport chain that actually signals the death knell for apoptosis. It goes out through a pore called the membrane, uh, mitochondrial membrane uh, permeability transition pore or PEP. So let's take a look at energy and this is going to be fun. We, just to bring you back into orientation, this occurred um, two to three billion years ago. This is where uh, it is in the evolutionary tree. But right now I'd like to discuss LUCA or the last universal common ancestor. Now, very important, this is a very important piece of news last year, um, in August of 2014. Uh, and this is even, I hope you read it, because this is even picked up by non-science journals. I actually got this blog from Investors Business Times, just to show you how important the finding was. And it showed that LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor, actually depends on the natural proton gradient in order to generate its energy. Now, Proton gradients that power respiration are as universal as the genetic code itself, giving an insight into the origin of life and the singular origin of complexity. So if you imagine Luca having this proton gradient, how did, how did it evolve? It actually evolved very little. This is the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane with the electron transport chain, as you can see, and you can see there. Complex 1, complex 3, and complex 4 are nothing but proton pumps. So we just really activated the whole thing, you know, made it, uh, uh, activated it so we could have a proton gradient anytime we needed. Why? Because dissipation of a proton gradient, we could actually um, uh, use it to drive uh, ATP synthase to produce ATP. We could use it uh, to generate heat via your uncoupling proteins, or just recently, we could use it to produce light. Yes, mitochondria actually produce light, and this will be the medicine of your children's children, but there's already work being done in it. When I was working on consciousness a couple of decades ago, we knew that the electrical, uh, electric and chemical um, power of the brain was not sufficient to synchronize consciousness. And so, right now, uh, there's a um, question whether or not the biophotons that are emitted by mitochondria could actually synchronize the brain. And in fact, there's a, this is a group of Iranian um, uh, uh, biophysicists who are proposing that mitochondria are emitting light and they're using the microtubules as the fiber optic cables that actually synchronize your consciousness. 
Now let's take a look at the proton pump a little bit closer. Um, if you take a look at complexes uh, 1, 3, and 4, they are the active proton pumps of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, biochemists here will disagree with me, but complex 2 is really not really that interesting. It's just such a big hydrogenase. So, um, well, what's interesting about these proton pumps is that uh, they're the genes that encode for them are conserved in the mitochondrial DNA. Now, why is that? Uh, it's because if you imagine that you have a microchip, right, that's producing the proton gradient, you cannot halve the microchip and give one to the male and give one to the female. Uh, so you have to deliver the uh, proton gradient making mechanism as an entire microchip. So nature did the best, the best decision ever, gave it to the female, right? So um, there are two reasons why the mitochondrial DNA was actually transported to the nucleus over evolution. Number one is that bacteria really exchange DNA. Second is bioenergetic. It's very expensive to actually replicate DNA. So if you're replicating structural DNA as well, you wouldn't be able to replicate mitochondrial DNA as quickly as we do now in order to change to uh, metabolic demands. Now, so these are the genes that actually encode for the pumps 1, 3, and 4. And for me, they're really the only interesting things in the bioenergetic side. This is mitochondrial inheritance. It's actually very simple. You inherit everything from your mother. Um, the mother can, can actually affect, uh, 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 give equal risk to both males and females, but only males, uh, the males cannot transmit um, the mitochondrial disease to their offspring. It's very interesting, I saw a poster last July, I was in a mitochondrial conference, and um, it's now known that females are actually uh, producing, um, uh, introducing mutations in the general population, human females, uh, that are either neutral or slightly advantageous to females in the population. So in classic germ warfare, uh, males are actually producing mitochondrial suppressor proteins to actually counteract these advantages that are being given by the females. Um, just imagine if we made a mitochondrial um, DNA, um, if we gave it uh, half to males and half to females, and it was an autosomal dominant inheritance, you could actually kill half of the population right away because the uh, circuit wouldn't work. Now, what is the upshot of this? Is This is the work of Dr. Wallace. Of course, he was able to trace the first female. It's called the mitochondrial Eve from out of Africa. And then from there, migrated all over the world. Now, what's interesting here is that it's actually the mitochondrial, the ancient mitochondrial mutations that actually allowed us to be able to live into various environmental niches. And in the Philippines, we have uh, predominantly the haplotype B. Now, what, does, what are these ancient mutations that allowed us to occupy the ancient niches? You see, we're, we were able to actually live in colder climates. So the concept that is uh, relevant there is called the coupling coefficient. You know, there's a proton gradient right there at the center, and it's coupled to production of ATP. Uh, so per unit of food that you eat, you know, you produce an equivalent of ATP. If you're tightly coupled, that's about one is to one. But if you are uncoupled, then you're, you're churning some of that proton gradient into heat. So for every unit of food that you, heat, you eat, you, you um, produce little ATP and you generate heat, and that allows you actually to live in colder environments. So I people in colder environments eat higher calorie, uh, more calorie dense foods like fat, for example, because they need to eat a lot more of the, of the calories because they're converting a lot of the stuff to heat. Now, so that's the, that's the way uh, that to look at this map. So uh, around uh, Africa or L0, you probably have a coupling coefficient, a one-to-one -one coupling coefficient. And as you get higher, the coupling coefficient, it becomes more loosely coupled. And that's the significance of the haplotypes, the different letters here, that uh, is actually a measure of your coupling coefficient. But that's a boring way of looking at it. The more uh, interesting way of looking at it is actually looking at endurance runners. Okay, most endurance runners are actually coming from Kenya, and their um, mitochondrial haplotype is either L0, L1, L2, or L3. Uh, they have a very, very, very uh, skinny legs. You know, they eat food, and it automatically gets converted to energy. 
right? But sprinters, uh, act usually, uh, you see them coming from cold climates, they usually have uh, haplotypes of H2, uh, H, U, J, or U, K. And you can see that their um, muscles, their thigh muscles are really huge. Uh, and the reason for that is that when you're running really, really fast as sprinting, you know, you can't provide oxygen fast enough to your mitochondria. So it has to rely on the glycolysis of the, of the muscle cells, and therefore the more glucose you have in there, the more you could provide energy and the more you could win your sprint. So um, I had a, a client uh, who had a 23andMe nuclear DNA testing done, and the SNP said, likely not a sprinter. Unfortunately for him, he was an Olympic sprinter. Uh, so I had a mitochondrial um, a haplotype done, and he was haplotype J. And he noticed that his best races were actually won in courses that were uh, actually cold, and he actually lost a lot of races when it was around the equatorial region. And that's the effect of your bioenergetics. It can trump your nuclear DNA SNP. Now, Many of you, or all of you here, are brilliant enough to hear what I've said about uncoupling. If I can eat more and just produce heat, then maybe I could use that as a weight loss mechanism, right? Uh, right here, you can use uncoupling proteins in order to dissipate the proton gradient and produce more heat. Can you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Take a look at this. You can actually uh, inhibit the protein gradient. Complex 1 is inhibited by, uh, for example, amical and demerol. Uh, complex uh, 2 is inhibited, uh, complex 3 is inhibited by um, uh, uh, antimycin, and complex 4 is uh, inhibited by cyanide and carbon monoxide. Now, yeah, but that's a proton gradient, right? But what's this down here? These are uncoupers. These are called protonophores. They can poke holes directly into your uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And the reason why I know about 2,4 denitrophenol is from my bodybuilders. Uh, they tell me that they're really, really fast, fast way of losing fat. And uh, this is on the black market. Now, 2,4 denitrophenol was introduced in the United States from 1933 to 1938. Uh, it was given to about 100,000 100, people. And the primary uh, effect was the patients felt very, very hot. And of course, you can still use this today. It, uh, it's in the black market. But it causes very, very rapid development of cataracts. So you can be the skinny bitch, you know, but you have to have the best intraocular lens implant. <laughs> um, a warning was issued in 2011 uh, that it can cause uh, acute toxicity and risk of death. But why take something like this? You know what can increase the expression of your uncoupling proteins? Exercise. So why don't you just exercise and increase your uncoupling proteins so you generate a lot more heat? So um, just bear with me with this slide. It just, just shows two, um, two of the haplotypes M, which is more coupled, meaning producing ATP per unit food, and less coupled, meaning producing more heat with unit food. If you take a look at, at, at a mutation, for different haplotypes, you could see that for a more coupled one, it just does altitude adaptation. You're adapted to uh, um, higher, alt uh, higher altitudes. But in a less coupled one, it could produce uh, diabetes and liver's hereditary optic neuropathy. And this is what is called evolutionary medicine. Now, the goal of evolutionary medicine is to understand why people get sick, not simply how they get sick. Modern medicine focuses on molecular and physiological mechanisms underlying health and disease, where evolutionary medicine focuses on why evolution has shaped these mechanisms in ways that may leave us susceptible to disease. And medical schools have been slower to integrate evolutionary approaches because of the limitations on what can be added to existing medical curriculum. Now, let's take a look at ROS and redox. Um, the takeaway from this slide is that your reactive oxygen species can actually be seen in, in these uh, red bumps right here, complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and the dehydrogenases that's where they form. A more complex slide is this, followed by circles. Here is a superoxide radical that's dismutated by manganese superoxide dismutase into hydrogen peroxide. And this is complexly producing a superoxide that's dismutated by copper zinc superoxide dismutase to hydrogen peroxide. And you can say, Dr. Ted, I don't need to learn about superoxide dismutase. But you do. If your patient asks you, Doctor, I'm taking superoxide dismutase supplement, is it good for me? 
And yes, that uh, one bottle there is actually a cream and it's used um, on the skin. So, reactive oxygen species are not all that bad. At uh, proper levels, they are actually used as signaling mechanisms for mitochondria. It goes out in the cell and it actually uh, communicates with the It's used as communication within the trees. Now, for redox, it can be used for redox signaling, but too much of the reactive oxygen species can cause damage to the electron transport chain itself. Um, it can cause uh, lipid peroxidation. In fact, you could think of it as rust. Everything is rusting, right? Including your mitochondrial DNA, your uh, your cell membranes, etc. This can exert a pressure on your upper permeability transition pore. It opens up, it releases your cytochrome C, activates your gas phases, and your cell dies. And this is a mechanism for disease and aging. So when you see something like this, where it is like everything and every disease that you can find, you all know now that the basis of this is inside your mitochondria. So can we measure this? Sure you can. Uh, glutathione and coenzyme Q10, we will talk about uh, in the next slide. But um, lipid peroxidizers, this is when I was trained in Paris, this is the only anti-aging test that we had. You know, if you were in the red, then you were aging faster than uh, uh, your chronological age. You were the green, you were aging uh, slower than your chronological age. And all of this is the oxidation of your cell membrane. 8 hydroxyduoxyguanosine is actually an oxidation of your DNA. And this is used uh, to assess the risk of your uh, uh, cancer, uh, your risk of cancer. And this is uh, actually used ahead of time before your other cancer markers appear. Now, I just learned about this. It was never taught to me in medical school. I never knew that the electron transfer chain can actually run in the reverse when you give too much antioxidants. So you should measure your antioxidants first uh, before giving uh, any antioxidants. So reactive oxygen species are a two-phase genus. Actually, it can promote stem cell renewal, proliferation, differentiation, healthy immune responses, and longevity. And on the other hand, it can cause stem cell exhaustion, tumorigenesis, autoimmunity, and senescence. So again, this is a, a, don't be scared of this slide. This just shows that if we can produce reactive oxygen species, we should have a way of dealing with it, right? And we deal with it basically with our thiol-based mechanism. Thiol, and this shows the role of sulfur in our bodies. Role of, uh, of sulfur in our bodies. So uh, there's the thioredoxins on the right side, which we will not discuss. But we'll discuss something that is very common here in the Philippines, glutathione which is right here. Now, glutathione is actually synthesized in the cytosol and then is distributed in cytosol, the nucleus, and the mitochondria. Uh, it's made of three amino acids. It's gamma glutamyl cysteinyl glycine, right? And the rate-limiting step for the production of it is actually cysteine. You could actually take, you know, glutathione as a supplement, but this is very poorly absorbed. And, um, uh, giving an acetylcysteine, for example, can raise your glutathione levels by as much as 80%. Um, unfortunately, I think here in the Philippines, anything containing cysteine is considered a drug well too bad. Um, but it's also interesting that I heard that they give glutathione intravenously, as you know, it will concentrate itself on the red blood cells, which don't have mitochondria and don't have any ROS anyway. So, this, of course, if you are actually uh, oxidizing uh, something, if you're cleaning up the rust on, on, on something, then the rust has to go somewhere. And this is the antioxidant uh, regeneration mechanism. You can see here glutathione and alpha lipoic acid actually uh, cycling around coenzyme Q10, vitamin uh, C, vitamin E, and, and vitamin E. And, you know, and they all go into a cycle, uh, reducing and oxidizing each other to maintain your redox balance. Now, can we measure this stuff? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we can measure coenzyme Q10, for example, if you're going to put your patient in statin, why not measure whether or not the uh, CoQ10 levels are adequate because uh, statins uh, inhibit hydroxymethyl glutarate and the synthesis of uh, your coenzyme Q. And here we can measure vitamin A, E, C, alpha lipoic acid, and of course, coenzyme Q10. Now, let's go to calcium and apoptosis. Calcium, this is a, actually a very simple slide. Don't get scared by it. All it says is that 
uh, the mitochondria is the calcium sink of the cell. If there's too much calcium in the cytosol, the mitochondria will try to buffer it. And when there's too much, it will exert pressure on the permeability transition core, open it up, and the cell will commit suicide. So, a simple way of looking at it, if you have calcium alone, then you have increased ATP, calcium plus a pathological stimulus, then you have increased reactive oxygen species production and cell death. This is another complex slide, but follow my circles. In the, in the presence of stress and or virus infections or increased ROS, then calcium actually enters the cell. And uh, actually, calcium is also released from the endoplasmic reticulum. And the cell tries to, the mitochondria tries to buffer it. If, if it becomes too much, it actually opens the permeability transition core, releases a cytochrome C, and it causes apoptosis. This should be a simple problem for the cardiologists that are in here because this is a mechanism for the, the pesky ischemia reperfusion problem that you always encounter. Uh, the mitochondria actually uh, tries to buffer the calcium that rapidly enters the cell. The mitochondria increases uh, uh, ROS production. It opens the uh, permeability transition core and you have apoptosis. That's why I, melatonin acts on this. is why I said melatonin is an overlooked antioxidant in these cases. Now, in skin and perfusion problem, this actually happens very acutely. But what if you stretch the skin and perfusion problem over years? That's called aging. It's the same mechanism. Okay? So, you, you have more and more and more apoptosis from the same mechanisms as uh, calcium regulation and um, and cross uh, production, and you actually kill more and more cells. Uh, it is said that the tipping point is age 45, I'm way past that. Um, and then you reach a functional threshold where actually there's also bioenergetic decline. And this is the mitochondrial theory of aging. The brain, heart, kidneys, muscles, and looking organs are first to go in chronic diseases and aging because they have a high energy demand but a low energy reserve. Now, again, this is a complex slide, but bear with me. We said that um, reactive oxygen species, like hydrogen peroxide, is used as a signaling molecule. So it comes from the mitochondria. It enters into the nucleus uh, of the cell. It can produce uh, hydroxyl radicals in the process. It damages your DNA, and it produces cancer. Now, let's take a look at this. A normal cell when it divides will produce two normal cells. A tumor cell when it divides can produce two tumor cells. However, if you transfer uh, a tumor nucleus into a cell with normal mitochondria, it will produce two normal cells. If you um, transfer a tumor cytoplasm with a normal mitochondria and a normal nucleus, you will actually produce uh, tumor cells. Now, this is another complex slide. Uh, but the, follow my circles. This is the mitochondria, which is affected by viruses, age, uh, rare mutations, inflammation, hypoxia, etc. And then it sends a signal to the nucleus. Uh, and then I shall be explaining the Warburg effect later. Since your cancer cells have defective mitochondria, they cannot do uh, aerobic uh, energy production. And so what you do is you actually um, decrease um, the glucose uh, intake of the cancer patient because you know that their normal cells can derive energy from fatty acids. So you drive up their fatty acids in your diet. And this model can act actually give you the cancer hallmarks, which is cell sufficiency in growth, and so on and so forth, which are the hallmarks of cancer. First of all, we have this oncogenic paradox, which has pu puzzled everyone from the beginning, the, the, the great minds and the thinkers. How is it possible that we can have so many provocative agents in the environment that we know cause cancer, cause the disease through a common mechanism, all right? So, for example, I mean, we, we have um, carcinogens, you know, we have radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, rare inherited mutations. People think cancer must be a genetic disease because I, got, I inherited a gene from my mother or my father and gave me cancer. That gene product targets this, this little organelle, the mitochondria, and makes it inefficient. So that is the primary cause of the damage to this organelle. All of these different provocative agents will do that. Viruses, people know, hepatitis C, papillomaviruses, they cause cancer. They cause cancer because they disrupt the energy metabolism of that organelle. At age, we get older. Older people are more prone to cancer than younger people because that organelle gets damaged with age. 
Now, what happens is when that organelle is damaged, it produces these reactive oxygen species, these are toxic byproducts of energy metabolism. And these ROS are both carcinogenic and mutagenic. They will damage the DNA in the nucleus, and they will further damage the energy metabolism in the, in the mitochondria. So these little ROS are produced from this plethora of disparate... Some people say, well, I don't know how I got cancer. I did this, I did that. You know, it could be from any one of these things damaging that, producing these ROS. The ROS then damage the DNA. In the, so all the mutations and broken dead chromosomes and all these things that we see and that we're studying and we're spending billions of dollars on are downstream epiphenomena of the damage to the respiration. So his main point there is that the nuclear damage is actually secondary to mitochondrial damage. Now, just a brief review before I introduce uh, the next video, is that um, the uh, glycolysis, of course, occurs in the nucleocytosol uh, organism. And uh, as I said, you know, the fatty acids uh, can actually be used by normal cells as fuel. They actually have a, a carrier um, in the uh, inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. It's the uh, carnitine shuffle. It uh, looks like this, and that's how they shuffle fatty acids into and out of the cell. And of course, we have a supplement for that as well. Um, so when, when you have cancer, one of the things you do is to place the patient on a ketogenic diet, meaning you reduce uh, glucose to about 50 to 100 grams a day so that it starves the cancer cells. You boost up the fatty acids so that the normal cells that can actually use these fatty acids actually are maintained in their energy. Well, we, 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 we designed a, a, a protocol. Now, we first had to characterize, yes, she has GBM patholo pathological report. Now, here's the big tumor uh, in the brain. It's a multicentric glioplastoma. These are the worst of the worst kind. I mean, these tumors are really nasty. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we got this. And then as soon as she came out of surgery, uh, we, uh, she went on a ketogenic diet, calorie restricted, therapeutic fast, water only, all this kind of stuff. We were able to bring her blood sugars down, her ketones up a little bit. And then we had an MRI several months after all this. Now, she was getting radiation and she was getting chemo. So not, not, not Tim is all of mine. She was off the steroids. She was getting radiation. But we have here a tumor several uh, months later, and we call this radiological resolution. You don't see any tumor in her brain anymore. And everybody was like shocked. Not that it doesn't happen. It happens very, very rarely. And maybe, maybe she's one of those rare cases. But we had several more like this over periods of months. And it looked like everything was good. So she, she was swimming in the Mediterranean. She felt good. Her quality of life was excellent. She gets off the diet. And then about two or three months later, the, the tumor comes back. And rather than going back on the metabolic therapy, she decides to go on Avastin, which is a big blockbuster drug in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. I said, don't use that. I, I've looked at Avastin. It's the worst of the worst drug. Never use it. The, the FDA pulled it off the market for breast cancer. But they haven't pulled it off for, for brain. Uh, the, the, the tumor came back, and she died. I had a similar case here in the Philippines, uh, my first case for uh, treatment of uh, cancer with um, ketogenic diet. A uh, patient came to me uh, with a stage 4 metastatic gland cancer in November of 2013. I put her on a ketogenic, uh, the, uh, the prognosis was until uh, February of 2014 only. So I put her on a ketogenic diet. She didn't return to me in February 2014, so I thought she had gone. But in May of 2014, uh, she uh, actually came back looking very pink and robust and actually kneeling on the floor. I said, no, this is your work. Uh, she was able to join her family uh, in California for her reunion in December. And in, uh, in March of this year, she stopped her ketogenic diet. I actually saw her in May uh, of this year, and I saw that uh, the, uh, she was, uh, again, having labor breathing and stuff. And I said, what did you do? He said, I, I was feeling so good, I quit my ketogenic diet. So it had returned. And she died in the United States this July. Now, um, he, the, uh, this is the treatment is a combination of caloric restriction, uh, and we're seeing studies like this now. Overnight fasting may reduce breast cancer risk in women. Of course, a ketogenic diet, where we know that a ketogenic diet, even if it does not cure you, it, it actually increases the quality of life in patients with advanced cancer. And of course, my special interest, for which I am uh, always called for, is the nutritional optimization of people uh, in these kinds of diets. 
I, we can also do this in our daily lives, uh, you know, caloric restriction. Some people, I know some people here fast or do the, the uh, two day a week fasting with uh, 500, it's actually reduced calorie with a 500 or 600 calorie uh, diet two uh, nine consecutive days. There is a ketogenic diet um, where you can actually, uh, it's known that if you fast for 12 hours, you actually increase mitochondrial biogenesis. So why not just sleep and uh, eat a little bit later, you know, uh, after 12 hours, just like getting a, um, your blood sample in a 12 hour fast, you can induce mitochondrial uh, biogenesis that way. And uh, don't eat any carbs for breakfast. And of course, nutritional optimization, make sure that all of your micronutrients are um, actually balanced. So there's a reason why I started with mom, uh, mitochondrial optimization medicine uh, versus mitochondrial medicine or mitochondrial disease. Now these are two different things. Mitochondrial medicine deals with heritable genetic diseases of the mitochondria, fermentations in mitochondrial DNA or in mitochondrial related DNA. It ultimately affects mitochondrial bioenergetics, which I am concerned with. Now, you can see tables like this. These are all in your handouts, and it's very uninteresting. That's why I don't like it. Uh, you can see uh, syndromes like MILAS, or uh, mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes, NARP, neurogenic weakness, ataxia with meningitis pigmentosa, MRF, by clonic epilepsy with rag ragged red fibers and muscle biopsy, which was discovered by Douglas Wallace. Now, uh, these are drugs with reported mitochondrial toxicity. These are also in your handouts, well, for weak acid, antiretrovirals, statins, aspirin, aminoglycoside antibiotics, acetaminophen, metformin, beta blockers, and steroids. Now, when you have mitochondrial damage, these tables on your slides, even your illness, even you, you know, will be given uh, this mitochondrial cocktail because there's really nothing that you can do much about it. So, coenzyme Q10, you know um, where's that, where that's coming from now. Carnitin, you know where that's coming from now. Now, creatine monohydrate, we give this uh, to patients. Why? Because mitochondria has an enzyme called uh, creatine kinase. And what it does, if your mitochondria produces uh, US dollars, it has to be converted to euro by the muscle in order to, be, to produce the energy. Now, um, uh, thiamine and riboflavin, we took that up in the B vitamins, alpha lipoic acid, we mentioned that, and arginine. Uh, you must remember that the, mar the mitochondria are involved in, your, in the clearance of ammonia in your body. It's, in, it's involved in the urea cycle. And arginine, ornithine, and citrulline are in fact also available as supplements. Now, uh, this is my definition of health. It's very simple. You, please take it away with you. Uh, health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by the absence of disease and the maintenance of balance between anabolism and catabolism according to the cycle life of the organism. A, the absence of disease is where mitochondrial medicine is, in fact, is where illness medicine is, and B, the balance between anabolism and catabolism is where mitochondrial optimization medicine is done. Now, we've just talked about mitochondrial medicine or mitochondrial disease. Let's take a look at mitochondrial optimization medicine. How is this done? It's done by clinical metabolomics. Now, if you are, I know some of you here are, are uh, medical directors uh, looking at um, deploying um, wellness strategies in addition to the illness medicine strategies in the companies that you supervise. And um, this is, the metabolome refers to a complete set of small molecule metabolites, such as metabolism, metabolic intermediates, hormones, other signaling molecules, and secondary metabolites to be found within a biological sample. Now, when I graduated medicine in 1984, that leads me, uh, genomics is all the rage, the human uh, genome project. We were expecting about 100,000 genes. We only got, uh, the, the, we only got 26,500. Last count last year was 19,500, big bust. Uh, proteomics has always been there uh, because of enzymatics, and now we're doing metabolomics. My personal prediction is that your children's children will be doing quantum biomics. Um, but this is the model. As you can see here, we can detect early onset metabolic deregulations before the pathology actually comes in. Say pathology A is diabetes, pathology B is Alzheimer's. Then you could detect actually subtle changes in the metabolome and you could institute the proper balancing mechanisms in, in form of health management. Now the three gears that we have in here driving the metabolic phenotypes, so you have genetics, 
Now we have to consider not only the nuclear DNA, but the mitochondrial DNA. Symbiotic partners, now we have to deal not only with the microbiota, but with the mitochondria. And the environment, the environment provides two types of signaling to our cells. One is the direct signaling, and the other one is by uh, indirectly via epigenetics. Now, this, is, this model is also in your handout. Now, this is uh, what I want you to come away with tonight. There's a nucleocytosol, cytosol mainly involved in structure, and there's a mitochondrion that is mainly involved in energy. They communicate via uh, direct mechanisms and epigenetic mechanisms. Um, and let's take a look at direct signaling quickly, just to get it out of the way. It's not that interesting. There's your mitochondria actually communicating with your nucleus via reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide. And since this is about energy, you have to give it energy signals. So it uses high energy intermediates like your NAD and ADH, or the ratio of your uh, AMP to your um, uh, ADP. And this is actually used uh, by the by the nucleus, if it detects that the energy intermediates are low, then it will start uh, revving up the oxidative phosphorylation in your mitochondria. And that's how it says, need more power, this is the way uh, this thing is done. I sat across the guy who actually discovered um, the switch for uh, adenosine monophosphate kinase. I didn't know that he was even the guy who discovered this. And he said, you guys, he said, why are you using metformin for anti-aging? And I don't. He said, because it keeps uh, MK actually turned on, and uh, the consequence of that is that it actually increases ROS production in your mitochondria, and therefore you actually get old after a while because of ROS damage. Now, epigenetics is a little bit more uh, exciting. It's the reason why I told Angelina Julie that it, it was really not a good idea to lop off her breast, but she went ahead and did it anyway. Um, so your, your chromosome, actually, uh, if you stretch it out, it's about six feet long. So it's super coiled, and it's coiled around um, um, proteins called histones. It's two and a half turns around like a yo-yo. And the inter there are two mechanisms of uh, main mechanisms of epigenetics. One is methylation, meaning it just a marking uh, with methyl groups. From this point, uh, from this point with the methyl group to that point in the methyl group, inactivate this particular cancer gene. And the other one uh, from the histones is acetylation deacetylation. What happens is that if it acetylates something, it actually loosens up the, the, uh, the winding of the DNA from the histones and it allows the DNA to be read. Now, um, uh, for example, um, uh, resveratrol is a histone deacetylator and that's how it communicates with your mitochondria and the rest of your cell. And so this is how uh, diet, aging, drugs, environmental chemicals, and childhood development actually communicate. This is how the, the environment communicates with the rest of your cell. So you now have no excuse for not knowing why do you exercise because of the epigenetic changes that it can induce in you. And what's exciting about this is that epigenetic changes are heritable. There's no mutation in the DNA itself, but you're able to to successfully silence, for example, your cancer gene, chances are, and I hope you're still old enough, you're going to pass on that silencing to your offspring. Now, simple way of looking at this in terms of epigenetics, just by methylation, is your food. If you take food rich in folic acid, for example, betaine, choline, B vitamins, methionine, etc., this will put in methyl groups in your DNA to silence um, unfavorable genes in your body, and that's how food actually affects your epigenetics. Now, this is a, uh, actually also in your handouts, but this just shows you how food affects your epigenetics. I actually have circled this because of Ben, loves red wine, and this is a histone deacetylator, but you could see uh, other um, uh, foods in there, like for example, your broccoli, your sulfur sulforaphanes, okay? This uh, causes histone acetylation. Now, um, um, I just made this up, mitochondrial optimization medicine in the health optimization uh, medicine or home framework, mom in the home. Um, it actually looks like this. Yeah, there's a level of uh, healthy levels of your metabolome, and you, we detect your cytotoxicities and borderline deficiencies using a clinical metabolomics laboratory. And actually, when they're in balance, we try to push them to optimal levels before illness actually sets in. Now, this is the summary. Uh, of what we talked about with tonight. 
Um, it's really very simple now that we've uh, discussed all of that. Nuclear DNA variation, mitochondrial DNA variants, environmental functions, all contribute to oxy oxidative phosphorylated dysfunction. And then uh, it causes progressive bioenergetic decline, leading, leading us to uh, the chronic diseases like ADPD, um, um, uh, muscle weakness, cancers, aging, inflammation, infections, and metabolic diseases. Since I'm a happy person today, uh, this is your Chief Happiness Officer signing off. Thank you. So now, dear doctors, we open the floor to questions. You may approach the audience microphone if you have any questions.